Again, welcome to the first session of Introduction to Experimental Psychology, Psych 224. So in this section, I'm going to go through with you what experimental psychology is. I mentioned earlier on that I'll briefly talk about the history of experimental psychology and then define what an experiment is. So we use the term experiment in our local parlance very often. So sometimes we'll say, I want to experiment with this kind of ingredients to cook a particular food, or I found a new route to my home and I want to experiment to see if it's shorter than the one I usually would take to my home. So we use it very often in our local parlance. But the question is, what does an experiment mean? And that is what I'll talk about. So basically, in ex um, scientific research, when we talk about an experiment, we are talking about the fact that we are trying something out, and that is what I will talk about, and then define what an experiment is. So by the end of this course, this session, you should be able to define experimental psychology. You should be able to outline how experimental psychology originated. I'm going to be very brief about that, though, and then also look at Zimni's definition of what an experiment is. So the key topics I'm going to focus on is what is experimental psychology and what is an experiment. And this is the reading list for this session. So you have Kent always and others, and also I've indicated that any introduction to psychology textbook will give you some basic information about this session. So what is an experiment or what is experimental psychology? I want you to briefly take a moment and think about these. If we talk about experimental psychology, what do you think? What comes to mind? What have you heard concerning this course? What have you read? And also what are you expecting to learn? So take a moment and think about these questions. So experimental psychology is a branch of psychology that deals with the process of sensing, it deals with learning, it deals with thinking, and also it, the world at large. Basically, it, um, it involves studying human behavior, so doing so using scientific steps. So for instance, you have a research question and you want to find out how you can answer this research question. There are scientific steps that you have to fo follow, procedures you have to follow to be able to answer that research question. So for psychologists, it is not enough that we are able to describe behavior. That is not the end of it. As a science, psychology attempts to understand behavior as well. Remember from your previous classes that you've learned that psychology is the study of human and animal behavior. So in studying behavior, we want to understand the behavior. We want to be able to explain the behavior, and we want to be able to predict the behavior. But ultimately, our aim is to be able to improve the lives of individuals and the world that we live in. And that is why we engage in experimentation. So psychology would rely on the scientific method because of the fact that it helps to eliminate biases and opinions. So sometimes we, have, um, we obtain information from various sources. People tell us things and we believe it. But the question is, are these informations that we obtain, are they void of biases? Are they void of opinions? So the scientific methodology helps us to eliminate these biases and opinions. It helps us to reach a consensus about how behavior truly operates because you are testing variables, you are controlling for variables, and then you are measuring variables. It also helps us to correct errors. So sometimes we have perceptions. For instance, people may have different perceptions about same-sex relationship or same-sex marriage. People may have different perceptions about um, teenagers and adolescents and how they interact with older people. So when we do research, we are able to remove any errors in thinking. Also, the scientific procedure enables us as researchers or psychologists to be able to answer questions concerning human behavior in a more valid way. Because obviously, the steps that we use are objective. Now, briefly to talk about how experimental psychology originated. Initially, as you may have read or as you may have been taught in some of the courses that you did previously, 
psychology did not begin as a science till the late 19th century. So people who are mentioned for moving this uh, field of psychology forward, which is experimental psychology, uh, Gustav Fechner, who was one of the first psychologists to study psychological processes. And he published his findings in a book he titled Elements of Psychophysics. And then we have um, Holmes, who also developed a, a theory on how people perceive color. So basically, with these kinds of researches, it brought about psychology being a science, and it also enhanced the field of experimental psychology. So we have again um, Wundt, who I'm sure you are very familiar with, because he was the first, um, the first psychologist to be able to establish, or the first scientist to establish a psychological lab, and this he did in Leipzig in Germany. So it was the, discover the discovery of psychology as an independent science is attributed to Wundt. I won't talk into details about this because I know you've done this in your previous um, sessions. So with the establishment of Wundt's um, laboratory, then psychology made the transition from being a philosophy to being a science. And that is how it all began. So what is an experiment? Let me try and define that. The question is, what do you understand by what an experiment is? Think about examples. So I've mentioned this earlier on, that an, exper an experiment is the scientific manipulation of some factors in the environment to observe its effect on the man of the manipulation on behavior. So we, we manipulate certain variables to see, for instance, how behavior will change when we manipulate these variables. So simply put, it's a process of scientifically confirming or disconfirming certain facts or principles or hypotheses. So basically, we manipulate certain variables. We observe the effect of these manipulations. And while doing that, we also try to control extraneous variables or hold them constant. So the question is, what variables do we manipulate? What variables do we observe? And what variables do we hold constant? Let me help you answer that. So we, as a psychologist or researchers, we would manipulate the independent variable, and then we observe the dependent variable, and we control or hold the extraneous variables constant. Now, this is what I want you to focus on. Zimni's definition of what an experiment is or what a psychological experiment is. So this is how he defines it. He says that it's an objective observation of phenomena that are made to occur in a strictly controlled situation in which one or more factors are varied and others are held constant. So note the terms or the words that I have underlined, the phrases I have underlined, and let's briefly look at what these phrases or words mean. So when we talk about observed, uh, objective observation, we are talking about making observations that is void of personal biases. So what have we observed in our environment? What have we observed in our society? What have we observed in our community? What have we observed interacting with individuals that we would want to investigate. And then a phenomenon refers to an occurrence or an event that we may be interested in investigating. Then we talk about strictly controlled situation. So we conduct the experiments such that no other factor is interfering with the conduct of the experiment. In the definition, it's also mentioned that one or more factors are varied and what that means is that we have the independent variable which is varied. So in experimentation, the researcher would vary or manipulate the independent variable and observe how this variation or this manipulation will affect the dependent variable. And then we talk about others, other variables being kept constant. Now these other variables that are kept constant are the extraneous variables. So these, as I mentioned earlier on in the introduction section, these are variables that are not of interest to the researcher but can affect the outcome of the study.
So for instance, we want to look at how maybe eating breakfast would improve performance of the performance of students. So we have a period where each morning we would give breakfast to students and then we we'll assess them at the end of the day. Because the literature says that if people are well fed, if they are not hungry, they can keep focus, etc. Now, what are some of the extraneous variables that can affect the study? For instance, if we are to test the students on a particular material and the students already have knowledge about this material, that would be an extraneous variable because you have some students who already know the material and some who would not know the material. So at the end of the day, if you find improvement in performance, you wouldn't be able to say whether it's the breakfast that they were given or it's because they had prior knowledge of the material. Another example, so this is the effect of practice on performance. Here we would manipulate uh, practice and we can vary practice by how the duration for practice, so how often people practice. So we can have two groups of participants, those who will practice a material for 10 minutes and those who will practice for 20 minutes and then we'll test them on a task. Now in this case, we may have extraneous variables such as noise, time lapse, prior knowledge, etc., affecting the performance of the students. So again, if the material we are giving to the students, they are already aware of this material, they have read it before, that can affect their performance. If there's a lot of noise in the environment while we are testing them, that could also affect concentration and affect their performance. So at the end of the day, we cannot say that it is practice that has affected performance because other variables have also affected performance. So again, I want you to familiarize yourself with Zimni's definition and look for more practical examples to explain this definition. This brings us to the end of this section.